Hello again, everyone. Melth here, with more of my Baldur's Gate 3 challenge run. Details of the rules will be in the video description as usual. Watch out for spoilers throughout this entire series, really. So, here we are back in Jurgle's little tomb. Let's talk to the man himself, we have nothing such as it is. Discuss. Continue on my way. He'll say this, but he has a fair number of things to say to us, actually. I must attend this place after so many years away. Seems to just mostly walk around and comment on all the uh, dust and how things have fallen apart a bit. Soon. This is funny because it could be like five seconds now. If we just go to camp immediately, he'll be right there. I do not know that hour. So only we, in fact, know the hour. It is whenever we go to camp. But I do know that the longer thou standest here. The farther away our second meeting becomes. Well, there's one more thing I ought to do here, and a fair amount of things to do this session. First of all, send most of the party over that way. Let's ungroup a starion and have a starion go over and loot that sarcophagus that I forgot over here. This time I want to finish up this dungeon, get back to town, do a bunch of events in camp, and then re uh, respect my characters to have actual good stats, and then get back into the adventure. Time to kill some more goblins or something like that. So, let's see what's in the sarcophagus. We get this spear called the Watcher's Guide. Now, it's a moderately useful spear. It's also kind of a lore item, I would say. See, the Watcher is the common name for the god Helm. who's sort of a paladin god, and also something of kind of an enforcer god, who the chief god puts in charge of things when he has something dumb to do and the other gods might object. Anyway, don't know how I'm supposed to find this out in-game, but person developer notes... Helm is the one who sentenced Jurgle to help us, basically, to make up for Jurgle having stupidly put the Dead Three in charge of death, which was gravely irresponsible, as I mentioned last time. So, the Watcher's Spear being there, I think, is kind of meant to be a hint about that. As, perhaps, are the spear-wielding, helmeted statues nearby that might be Helm. Anyway, we can pick up the treasure here, then get back to town. What have we got? There were a fire? Eh, okay, sounds good to me. Back to town. Now, last time, because I put Carla into the party and leveled her up, that would have reset the merchant's inventories. So might as well check what they've got. See if there's something new there. And of course, sell off the things that I've currently got. Oh, here's a conversation. So this time, Le Boing Zell is the one holding the sanity ball. Okay, let me dispel my disguise here so that merchants will know who I am and therefore I won't have wasted improving their attitude toward my last time. So, let's mostly just sell things to Aaron. I think. I doubt have anything new that's worth buying. We've got a lot of items to sell, plus a few that I actually haven't sent to camp. That spell is pretty much worthless. Let's sell that. Don't need that or that. The shield is ugly. We have plenty of better shields that we can use now. Book is surprisingly valueless compared to some dead fisherman's love letter. Let's see... I think I want to buy these gloves. They're pretty expensive, but they go a long way to reducing the damage they take, because range attacks are hard to avoid completely in this game. So let's buy that, and then while we're here, I might as well also just sell wares from this person, and that, and that terrible club, and your wares. Keep that armor, you'll be using that. The spear might have its uses, so hold on to it for now. Holy water I can probably sell, though. Okay, that should be enough money to respect, which we'll hopefully be doing shortly. Now, some of you asked me in the comments, what will I do about the story? Because you can't really advance the story or get various kinds of quests and whatnot unless you long rest. And my solution basically will be this. If I rest now without using any food supplies or anything like that, I have spent no resources, no spell slots, no hit points, no anything. So I get nothing back from resting. So mechanically, it's like I didn't rest at all but I can get the story to advance this way. So that is my plan, basically to rest at the very beginning of the act before I've done anything, get the story to advance that way, then do it again at the end of the act when nothing else is going to happen anyway. So that way I hope to just get the narrative advantages of being able to actually see everything in the game while avoiding any kind of mechanical restoration. Uh, here we get this conversation with Will and Carlac, who apparently held out until now before having this little chat. Well, I'll be God's damned. Blade of Frontiers. Thought I'd shaken you for good. 
That'll teach me to underestimate you. This conversation would basically never happen unless we rested. They're just kind of adventure together with no comments. Come to burn the sword coast to ash. Little melodramatic will. If by met you mean hoofing it through the hells with this fucker on my tail. Shut it, devil. I know you're You know, there can't really have been that much time for him to be on her tail, right? Because she only recently betrayed Zarya. Also, only have been after that that Mazora would have sicked Will on her. And then they immediately got captured by the Nautiloid. Well, I don't know, she boarded it, then they captured, and then they got invested. It's hard to make those events make sense. They must have happened super fast. A great fire roars through me. The fire of the first hell. You are Karlak, tearing through demons across a blood red land. Again, I think it would be cool if we saw this. That would be good use of the video game medium. That would make these little mind flare visions actually make some sense from a game narrative perspective. But if we're just getting it in narration anyway, wouldn't it be better to just, you know, describe it in character, narrate their, you know, history that way? If we needed to, even. For that matter, you know, insight is supposed to find out when people are telling the truth or lying or whatnot. Shouldn't we be maybe using that you know, skill at this point to find out who's being honest? That's what the skill is for, after all, rather than having mind players reveal the truth to us. It's okay, but a little heavy-handed, I think. She is a victim of the blood war, not an agent of it. By Baldurin's helm, I... We'll find Baldurin's helm later. I will not be tricked. You saw the truth. I may be an effective soldier, but I never wanted to serve Zarya. Legged it away from her the first chance I got. And yet you served. I don't know, but not a danger, but better than some people here. His lips straighten. Sheer dread twists his face. This probably should be an incident no. other than perception, but... Devils cannot be anyway, it just kind of makes sense. He has his own motive here for not wanting to believe this. But I do think one cool good thing is that he actually approves of us trying to talk sense into him. I think one thing that's really great about this game is that a lot of the time the characters, unlike in some RPGs, but they basically just want you to go along with whatever dumb idea they have, and that's what they approve of. In this game, they often approve of you just kind of pointing out to them that they're not being their best selves and they're not being sensible. At least the ones like Will, who are intelligent and mature people, do that. Shit! Shit. You really are no devil, are you? I've... I've been deceived. Oh, thank the gods. Thought I was gonna have to take... Yeah, except for that line, which is okay on its own, but gets repeated so many times throughout this game. It's a pretty good conversation, I thought. <laughs> but like, a hundred times where people say, take your head, as their favorite way to say kill in this game. It becomes... Really repetitive, and really starts to catch your ear once you know about it. Karlak. I promise not to lose sight of it, even when the hells burn hottest. Okay, it was almost as hot as a furnace in here, so I have to take a break and take my jacket off. Let's see what Karlak and Will have to say for themselves after that little display. Even more glad he decided to stick around. It's a pretty. I mean, given how she's literally on fire all the time, probably giving off light and heat and smoke, and is loud, it seems like she'd be really trivial to track her down. After all, that's how those Zarya goons keep finding her, right? All the time. Reputation for being lethal with that blade. I'm glad it's on our side. Likewise, of course. Need to find a way forward. Now, Zarya will have stupid things to say about this, I'm sure, as he usually does. <laughs> Nothing like a little camp drama to spice up the evening. <laughs> it's almost a pity things ended so amicably. Seeing those two duke it out would be fun. Yeah, he just kind of likes senseless violence as his thing, so. Let's go and talk to Will. We'll keep being cagey. So I suppose the show must go on. And I've played my part all too poorly. It means There's kind of a reason he won't tell us the details here, but it doesn't... Like, if he got creative, he could definitely tell us, so. One night soon when we make camp. I guess we're supposed to pretend that it's not blindingly obvious that he's a warlock, even though it's on his character sheet, matches his abilities, warlocks are pretty common in setting. You're not in any danger, I promise. I can't say the same about me. 
Well, with that, we can complete this little story moment. Yeah, Jurgle wants to speak, but he kept us waiting while he swept the floors and whatnot, so too bad for him. So, I am in a bit of a bind at the moment. Because back in Ep3, I knocked out Alfira, thinking that that would mean that she'd be unconscious for the first time that I camped, which would make the Dark Urge scene happen. However, I didn't realize that Will Carlock scene would take precedence over the Dark Urge scene, which so she's now going to be healed up and conscious again, so when we rest next, she will show up in camp and then get killed. So, to save her life and therefore get her interesting quests and story events and things like that in Acts 2 and 3, I have to knock her out again. Which is not hard to do mechanically, but man, it makes no sense narratively. So, we're going to pretend this doesn't actually happen in character, I think. This is not canon. We knocked her out just the one time. I probably had to fight a guard over this too, so it's going to be a bit of a nuisance. Speaking of a guard, let me maybe disguise myself so he'll pin this on some... Drow rather than on me, because the guard is also a shopkeeper, and I don't want to lose my good attitude with him. Get going. Making me sweat. All right, so I guess I can increase my odds of knocking her out quickly if I trade those items. Maybe get a little tiny bit more damage. Come on, let's go. Stealth mode activated. Let's give it a try. And quickly before she can react, hit her again. Okay, that should allow us to now knock her out before she can do much of anything else before the guard gets here. So, let's make sure that we've got non with on. Yes, we do. Can I knock her out with a sneak attack? Probably. Yeah, she actually lowered her attitude toward Ballista, but hopefully she'll be alright. No one stopped me yet. All right, well, that was awkward, and again, uh, that doesn't count for canon. We didn't do that. We knocked her out only once. Let's just uh, pretend this never happened and go back to camp. Too bad, Jurgle. You kept us waiting while you cleaned up your little tomb house. Well, that's odd. We can see her in camp before the conversation starts. We can also see his exclamation point on Withers. I wonder if it's a, a real thing in the universe, like he has a cardboard cut up an exclamation point with maybe a little wire holding it over his head. But then here is Will, the replacement for Alphira. The fail set to make sure the Dark Roach always murders someone no matter what you do. Ogma is a, guard, a god rather than many bards acknowledge. Well met. Goblins roughed me up and stole my hose when they heard me singing Hatchling Love. <laughs> you wouldn't have half a bedroll. Half a bedroll? Is this the share? I, I mean, pay for my board to me, Dragonborn look like they're covered in like spikes, spines, and scales and ridges, and would probably not be nice to be near while you're trying to sleep. But I think in character, we probably want to wonder. welcome but watch Traveler. We might need help. We shouldn't be sent out into the dark. Even though we're actually in the middle of a safe druid grove, so eh. I, ice blood, but I, I get cold so fast. <laughs> I need to be by the fire. Well, we can talk with her and get a bit of character development before she dies immediately. Thanks for Just enough to make us feel bad about killing her, I suppose. I prepared a dense manuscript of new love chants. As a bard, all this of course is interesting. Until he hears throat song. And she just assumes we don't know anything about Dragonborn culture. That's <laughs> probably pretty common among human upper classes, too, I would think, in this era. But I've never even been kissed. And I can't stop. I don't want to burst your bubble, but you don't have any lips. I don't think I'm sure you can do some kind of intimate gesture, but I don't really know if it counts as kissing. Really. Not even when duty stamps us down. And that's what the songbook's about. Lost, lingering love. Never acted on. Never spoken. Well, even by Bard's center, she seems a little bit melodramatic, but Ballista at least doesn't want her to go out in the wilderness and get killed. My clan name has been struck. I named myself anew after a long dead poet. That poor poet, the name Quill Rootslang. Is there someone who you think you might love? 
Well, that seems like an abrupt change of subject. I won't tell. Now, I think Ballista, of course, has just met these people, so, um... He might just go with this. Or he might get kind of an, an evasive answer. I mean, he likes Shadowheart, but he doesn't... He's known her for, like, an hour. Yeah, I mean, a day and an hour, but... This is true, but not in a positive way. This is true, but kind of evasive. He might go with that. And have you said he's so? not sure he's interested. Do they know even one little bit of how you really feel? There's a special feeling to having love all to yourself. Don't you think? For no one to know. <laughs> I grew up smiling about my little secrets to myself. You know, I feel like I do like how they introduce this character. It's enough character development to make it seem like it's a shame that she gets randomly killed, even if she is a little silly. So, pretty well done for just shoehorning in a character to replace a fear of possibly getting unexpectedly killed by the player, which is what must happen based for this to come about. Whole life ahead of you. Are you about to retire in a day? You have like a picture of your family to show us? This is funny, of course, too. <laughs> Sure. I would bet as a bard who's heard these before, but spoken it's... like someone who's never heard a dragonborn folk song. This one, Sky Swain, is about what it might feel like to mate in the air in the age where wings were yet with us. There's so many ways to get wings or just fly in this universe. Oh well. Well, as another bard said, brevity is the soul of wit, so let's keep it to that, perhaps. One trick that I can... Oh, let's talk about this first. I'll come back to that trick. So our first Dark Urge cutscene here. Paul Lissa would like to pretend he's totally surprised by this, but he's not entirely, given that he's had all these murderous impulses. Only really her midriff looks different, but sure, beyond recognition. Her blood covers you, and its warmth feels like the embrace of an old friend. Wasn't she just talking about how cold her blood was? Nothing of how you ended up here, but your head pounds and aches. Well, let's see if I can pass this check. It doesn't really matter, but I just want you to notice that I can't apply my guidance ability here, or basically any other abilities. While you're in camp, your equipment doesn't really seem to apply, and neither do many other kinds of bonuses you can get. Which doesn't matter now for this, which is not really important. But it's life or death for some things later on in the game, with darker age plot ones that could make you have to turn against your entire party if you fail one check, and you can't really prepare for it because you can't use items. I don't really like that. Flash of abject terror in her eyes, blood spilling from her lips. What? Lips? Last words. Well, okay, I'm being too flippant about this. Ballista is certainly confused and distraught. No matter how it appears, the body is there, and her blood is on your hands. The question flows through your mind. Who are you, really, that you could be guilty of such bitter business? And I was starting to wonder about that myself at this point, although, of course, for my run it was Alfura instead, when I was first going through this. Something wicked must have woken you. The contemptible pervert. I like the writing there. The word lavish is, I think, upon the girl. good choice. But where, oh, where could that monster have come from? If only you knew yourself better. I was, though, getting worried about how the Darkridge plot would turn out at this point. Because this feels like a pretty random murder, you rather than, as I've been hoping, more of a mystery to uncover to about, act. you know, what the character would be and what's making do these strange things. The others awaken and begin to cast blame for the hot sin before you. Well, Ballista has been totally upfront with him before about his murderous impulses. He's not going to hide it now. He expects most of them will probably leave. But that's their right. Your that makes sense. Bright and clear as the dawning day. So, he's going to try to be honest here, although the game will force me to be dishonest, unfortunately. I feel like I should have just you know, woken them up to talk about it, rather than just go back to bed. But that's just how camp scenes work, I guess. This is some sloppy 
work. Now, I can't help but notice that one of us is positively drenched in blood, so... You talk. So the two people who said that, you know, capricious murder are good, and this guy who would tell me to embrace the dark urge and now, you know, complaining about the consequences, but... He's going to try to be honest again. And Astarian even approves of this. So, so far he can still be honest. But jump to this conclusion and I can't tell them that they're wrong about it. Not a single one of them will apparently connect to the fact that I just told them all like the day before, Hey guys, I get these random murderous impulses to kill things. So all I can do here is remain silent. And lie by omission. We can but stand guard against the That's a great idea. Let's do that. Let's just, you know, stand guard. We have plenty of people to do that. Or we could, like, time our wrists at night. We do that later on and that works perfectly. But we do nothing instead. So, not a very wise party. Every one of your instincts screams against the saccharine thought. The more we resist the dark urge, of course, the more intense it gets and the more hard to resist certain dangerous plot points become. But, in any case, for now there's not much to do. I don't think she has anything. I'll just check her inventory just in case. Yeah, no. Okay. Well, let's leave camp, go back, get some more plot events. So here's Will's patron showing up. It was nice of her to you know, wait in line for the Dark Urge stuff to happen. I think that's a cool effect of how she showed up, too. The inky black pool that she emerges from. Will, you've been naughty. And you know what happens when you're naughty. God damn it. I do think it's also a good twist on things that Carlac knows rather than just kind of being a thing between only Will and his patron, which is, you know, would have been fairly bland. Now? But I'm just getting comfy. The you know, smugness the is, I think, well written to make you hate her. Fount of his power. It's hard to really do anything to get back at her throughout the entire game, but I did find one way in Act 3, assuming they haven't patched it out. So hopefully I'll show you that when I get there. And you can let her get killed in Act 2, but then Will dies too. So. Carlac's still breathing. I've taken more pleasant shits than you, Mizora, and at least those can be buried after. That's no kind of talk for a lady. By the way, Carlac, Zariel sends her regards. You told me, devils only. It does seem like Will was not too right to agree with a devil to a contract that the devil will only be trustworthy and will only have him kill devils and demons and whatnot. Clause G, section 9. Target shall be limited to the infernal, the demonic, the heartless, and the soulless. And we don't actually know it yet in character, but Carlos doesn't have a heart. Pet. Trust me on this. If we had found it out already, she'd say that that's by virtue of her having no heart. I'm surprised Shadowheart approves, even that she's supposed to be all about discretion and not taking pointless fights. Lemures are the, the lowest category of devils. There's kind of one for demons, so I think they're called mains. Uh, both names come from Roman mythology. You know, Lemures, or uh, mains, or larvae in some versions, were these kind of sometimes evil ancestor ghost type things that they believed in. What they believed is that they changed a bit era by era. But in D&D, they became kind of the lowest versions of demons and devils. And their torment. So he kind of gets his dumb-looking devil horns that ruin his appearance, and we can't just like, take a hacksaw and remove them for some reason. We're stuck with it looking like this for the whole rest of the campaign. Not having that happen was the best perk of just killing Karlak and reviving her. Forget the outfit you can get. What the hells have you done? A promise broken, a price paid. You know the terms. 
We'll get used to the new form. It does seem like it would probably be fixable with things like Wish, for example. Back. Some magic even I can't undo. Limited Wish. Now. Let's see how the front And I like this, you know, precious I, Will, of course, thinks he made some kind of good deal with her where he gets the power to then help be this great hero who defends the frontiers. But I think you can make a reasonable argument that probably what just happened is that the devils tricked him into becoming a less heroic figure who people would distrust, who would you know, break their relationship off with his father, who was also a great hero, and thereby undermine heroics and goodness on the coast. Devils never do anything good whatsoever. So, that's my interpretation of why I should make this pact with him in the first place. Will is just kind of still being duped. But I don't know if we ever really get confirmation about that, per se. Alright, well, let's see what Karlak has to say about this. No comment about how she knows Mazora here. This is true. The bar is a little bit low for some of these party members, but... You can say that again. When he was chasing me through Avernus, I thought he was just another sad merc. How wrong I was. Well, let's talk to Will about this. God's damn her straight back to the hell. And she's already there. Just look at me. I did what was right, and Mazora made me pay for it. Sounds like hunting devils. devils and demons, she said. Traitors and hypocrites, heartless evils of all sorts, but not, not Zariel's victims, not innocent tieflings. I think one could probably make an argument that she does, in fact, have a heart. It's called a heart in all respects. So clearly, this should have been not okay by the contract. But this, this is a good point to make to Will. You'd think it's a lesson I'd have well learned. It's Mazora who grants me the power. Yes, to obviously. And cast Eldritch blasts. Before I was infected, I could even Next, you know, we're we'll finding out that Shadowheart, of all people, is a shark cleric. Every thrust of my blade and every flame I sparked was for the good of the coast. I can't utter the terms or circumstances. I think if he was creative, he could definitely communicate it to us. But it's kind of a plot contrivance here. Unforbidden, unless Mazora permits it. But I'll say this. The moment I Probably saves the writer's trouble actually writing up a pact, which would then be it yeah, difficult and possibly full of loopholes people could point out if they were able to see it in writing. All I can give you on that is my solemn and maybe he's right about that, but I think when we hear the story that maybe he was kind of duped into it, and it's kind of the devil setting him up for a fall. In any case, off to bed. Again. Oh, two events in one night. I guess it's the other half of the Dark Urge thing. That poor girl you killed from your head. You wonder what she looked like as she died. Squirming. Skewered in abject agony. I will say, the first Dark Urge murder may be a paradigm. Have ever anybody else showed up in camp or just kind of a cute character? I figured they were there for the Dark Hearts to probably end up killing them or something like that if I made the wrong choice. So, the writing was effective that way. Like that kid, uh, Yenna, I guess, in Act 3. I was sure she'd either get killed by Orin or by the Dark Urge. And I guess Orin is a possibility. Such rushes from your thoughts of the dead woman. Why did she die? The mystery gnaws at your pounding heart. And this is when I, on my first Dark run, went, Oh, no. Oh. Because here he is calling us violence if it was a compliment. I absolutely hate this kind of cartoony villainy where characters call themselves evil or vile proudly. It's just the dumbest thing. And have a goblin for a butler. No class whatsoever. So at this point I realize that the mystery that I've been hoping for and the more to the Dark Arts plot than just random murders was out the window. It was going to be just the dumbest kind of cartoon villainy, and I was almost certainly going to be a ball spawn. I was sure at the end of this conversation. I think this is a reasonable question to ask any goblin that claims to be a butler. He's really more of a valet when you hear about what his duties were, I think, but... Yeah, proudly calling himself unprincipled. Yeah. 
I really just, I want a serious-ish story with characters grappling with the strange, mysterious problem of this guy killing people at random. Or, better than that random, for some kind of unknown plot. But instead we just get this nonsense. I mean, and I know of course that Ball Spawn, which we're about to find out we are when he keeps talking about our inheritance in like three seconds, are a major part of things in Baldur's Gate, but it's a vast, vast setting. Surely, it could have done something more interesting than just repeating the Ball Spawn plot for the third time. So, as I said, the Dark Arts thing was one of the few parts of the game that really disappointed me a lot. I was hoping for something interesting and mysterious and to find out some... I don't know, a demon, or some evil god that isn't just Ball, or something even more creative with behind things, but no. Fine, breeding another reference to us being a Ball spawn. And another little plot contrivance here. Triumphs? Uh, I cannot. I am forbidden to interfere. Our betters will not allow it. We could just grab him and read his thoughts, or make him talk, or do anything, but I guess we won't do that. I just hate everything about Scleritus Fell and his role in the plot, and... Ah. Just the worst character. I don't mean, like, morally the worst, I mean, I just... I hate that kind of writing. You don't sleep well. Flitting yeah, I don't blame Bolas for not sleeping well after tires. that goblin butler and the murder maybe the night before. What, two nights before? Is wrong. Or maybe you just get lucky. Do you really think it was good to pick the person lying right near the fire in the light right now could look up and see you? I mean, apparently no one's on their bedrolls for some reason tonight, but... It's not what it looks like. I swear. I... I he just swore something that's false, so he's adding perjury to uh, assault and being a vampire and whatnot here. There in the dim it's exactly what it looks like. See him for what he really is. Yes, obviously he's a vampire. A slave. It did kind of bug me we couldn't just figure this out when it was so obvious, but... Oh well. We have to kind of put up with the, uh... Alleged mysterious characters. I've never killed anyone. Well, not for food. I feed on animals. I too like his little deer. Kobolds, Kobolds line there. <laughs> but it's not enough. Not if I have to fight. I feel so weak. Of course, wouldn't this be standard for you? Because you never actually fed an intelligent being before. Better. Kobolds don't count, they're not intelligent. Please. They're stupid. A strange sensation courses through you, and your companion's mind unfolds. Secrets half revealed. I guess we can't do that because we haven't done any rest and have used his ill power once a long time ago. But basically we just find out that yeah, he only ate animals because his master compelled him to rather than out of any moral qualms. This is a silly question, but I guess we've got to ask it. At best, I was sure you'd say no. More likely, you'd ram us... You actually can do that in instant kill, and it's pretty funny. No. I needed you to trust me. And you can trust me. Because we don't have a choice. Not if we're going to save ourselves from these... worms. Kind of has a point mind. there. You need me so Despite that, he'll totally kill you if you don't stop him, though. Please, only be a taste. I swear. Yeah, he's I'll swearing falsely again. This guy. Play, and everything can go back to normal. So, of course, ordinarily, Valessa would absolutely refuse this. But I think right now he's feeling a lot of self-hatred and is in a very dark place. And the fact that he's not just a murderer, he also has a goblin for a butler. You can't go lower than that. So, he might do something unusual for him here, really? and agree to this, I... and regret it pretty much immediately. Of course. Not one drop more. The intelligent thing would of course be to wake up the other party members so they can enforce this just one drop or whatever type rule, but we don't do that. So, you're at risk of getting killed by a Starian now, although I think it's pretty trivial to stop him. These are some silly looking shoes for adventuring. 
It's like a shard of ice into your neck. A quick, sharp pain that fades to throbbing numbness. Your breath catches. Your pulse quickens. I do appreciate they just keep giving me the option to just keep staking him at every point in the conversation. That one's pretty much an auto success for my character, unless I roll a one. But if you failed that and failed to push him away, he'll just will kill you. Of course. That. That was amazing. Good voice Your acting here. Finally clear. I feel strong. And he will be a little bit stronger. In fact, the high elf race is, I would say, not the very good overall. But Astarian in particular is pretty much the best party member just because of his happiness bonus that we can see, you know, tomorrow. Shouldn't take long. So many people need killing. And he immediately makes Bolas feel no, bad about even this perk of him me? being powered up. You're invigorating, but I need something more filling. This is a gift, you know. I won't forget it. You watch as he stalks towards the forest, stronger, more confident. Ready to hunt. You forgot to crouch, though. That gets funnier every time you say it, Withers. Alright, let's talk to a star again here. Good morning. How do you feel? A lot of regret, and he probably feels awful, too. A pity. Just be grateful I'm not a true vampire. This has always been a thing in D&D lore, that from them and you might wake probably just just by having lower level vampires like so that weaker sense. characters can fight them, instead of the super yeah, strong high level vampires, yeah, the full ones vampires. or whatever. So, not anything new for this game. Now, this question doesn't make sense, but it's the only way to have this conversation, so I guess I'll go ahead with it. I should be cinders in this light. I hadn't seen the sun for 200 years before we crashed here. Someone, or something, wants me alive. We never really do get a good answer to this. It's something to do with the Mind Flayer Parasite, because he loses the powers when the Parasite dies, but it doesn't really make sense. There's no reason that the Mind Flayer Parasite would be able to protect a vampire from sunlight. There's no connection there that I can think of whatsoever. Or no reason they would want to, because Mind Flayers canonically hate vampires, and undead in general are a major threat to them, because they can't normally seromophores them, and they can't read their minds, and they can't control them or anything, so... That's my theory, but who knows? I'm just glad you're being sensible about these uh, revelations. I was worried people might turn up with torches and pitchforks. I do like this moment. <laughs> Vamps don't scare me, as long as they keep their teeth to themselves. No sense judging someone for who they are. Except devils, obviously. And demons. And goblins. For his sake, you he best not develop an appetite for Githyanki. He's not wrong. We're bound together, no matter what comes. We all have our shit to bear. As long as you remember your manners, Astarium, you're welcome at my fire. There now. How did they find out anyway? They did nothing in the night, but now they all knew he was a vampire in the morning. Anyway. Long day indeed. I think there is one more little story scene I've kind of got to do before we can truly get into the adventure with no long rest whatsoever. But, it should be a pretty brief little aside there. The reason I've got to do it now is that otherwise the game will force you to do a rest, and it'll actually be a full rest even with no supplies. So if I don't do it now, well, I don't need healing, or almost now we don't need healing, it'll kind of spoil the run. So, got to do a little bit of adventuring so I can unlock that last scene that'll force a full rest. Do that while I don't actually need any healing, so it won't actually do anything for me, and then I can get on with things properly. And that delicious moment we shared. You know, I don't think we shared the deliciousness of that moment. Insofar as I was delicious, that was a one-sided experience. The very same. I've had this condition for two centuries, but truth be told. <clears throat> you were my first. In all these years, I've only ever fed on beasts. Drinking the blood of thinking creatures is a different thing entirely. Bolas is not happy to hear that because he doesn't like the idea of Astarian 
feeding on any other creatures. Especially given that he seems to just kind of be murderous and self-centered in general. And now he's saying this out loud. Now, better they saying it out loud than that he's just plotting it, I guess. He's thinking this, but he won't say it. He'll just be watching a star again. Alas, it doesn't hurt to ponder the question, though. Take Gale, for example. He strikes me as someone whose blood is rich, refined, like well-aged brandy. I think you're being classist and assuming that the rich people like Gale taste better. But the gift? What in the hells would she taste like? Probably like mind flare, slime, and hatred. <sighs> yes. Heavens forbid we have an interesting conversation. Still, I am intrigued by the possibilities. Absolutely. A mere thought experiment. So, in the spirit of theoretical questions, if you had to take a bite from one of them, who would it be? I wonder if this is only a dark urge answer, or if anyone has it. He'd probably say Astarian, but not necessarily meaning it in the complimentary way that Astarian will take it. Just that if he had to bite someone, he wants it to be... Oh. This twerp who, who has it coming. Such taste. Unfortunately, all this talk is getting me hungry. I better find something I can actually sink my teeth into. <laughs> Don't tempt me, darling. You know, Starin, you might consider like wearing a breastplate so you can't be staked in the heart super easily. I guess we can take care of that once we respec a moment early. Alright, you're right about that. There are indeed important matters to discuss, mostly respecing. So let's take care of that. We meet again. I want to talk a bit more about my strategy here for my team composition to get into this and about the choice thing we'll be making. Once we get past this little conversation with Withers, of course. Thou hast need of my services. I wanted to just say this because his, his response is pretty funny, well voiced, I think. No. And of course, we can't really enforce our wish here because he's invincible. A mending of the threads between. Which isn't the most interesting thing, death. but it's fine. Should thou or any of thy compatriots perish? Now, this again kind of would, in DD terms, trivialize the whole problem with the mind flayers because it's a canonical thing that if you fix a mind flayer parasite, you can just kill the person, remove the parasite, and then revive them. And if he can just revive people without even needing the body, which is what he can do, it should be super easy to fix this problem. But we kind of just pretend that it doesn't work in this game. Because it is my calling, there is little else. Shift looks over to the side, not one of the comments that he's you now the old god of death. And all he asks for is a small amount of gold, so anyway. He doesn't comment on this capability, but that's by far his most important one for this run, because of course it's permanent, so I won't be reviving anyone. So as I was saying, for a run like this, team strategy is important. I want a party that can cover all bases and support each other. Now there are two main areas of threat to prepare for. Firstly, some conversations and skill checks can either outright kill party members or cost you opportunities or party members if you fail them. In a run where you can't do any saves coming, that's a big deal. My main character in particular has to handle many such conversations, and Bard is simply the best class for the job. You already want to have Charisma as a Bard, which is the win conversation stat. And of course, you also have more skill points than almost any other class, and more double proficiency than almost any other class, and you also get this unique enhancement called Jack of All Trades, you get bonuses to every single skill that you don't even have, or things that aren't even skills. Plus, you have spells to enhance yourself further. So, really, really good at that job. Other party members can help with things like guidance or resistance. The other main category of danger is, of course, combat. A run like this is a marathon, not a sprint. I need to endure many combats, and I can barely heal at all. So as much as possible, I need to avoid taking damage in the first place. Now, one way to do it is just have a good armor class and good defensive abilities such as a lore bard's cutting words or a light cleric's warding flare to make enemies miss. But that should be my last line of defense, because it's the most luck-based. My first line of defense is maneuvering to use the terrain to protect myself. That's the best option because it's free. It doesn't cost any spell slots, doesn't usually cost any actions either, and can be very effective, but it is very battlefield-dependent. 
To maximize that, I want to have party members that have good mobility, in all three dimensions preferably, and of course, which also have range attacks so they can stay away from melee enemies. My second line of defense is disabling enemies with status effects and debuffs so that they can't attack me. The best status effect in the game is called Dead. Most enemies are vulnerable to it, it means they can't take any actions whatsoever, and the duration is really long. So, I want to inflict Dead as fast as possible on the most dangerous targets in every combat. That starts by having every party member consistently win initiative, and then continues by having people do good damage as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible. So ultimately, there are only two useful party roles for this kind of run. Damage and control, for the enemies that you can't just kill off fast. It is of course valid to enhance another party member's damage rather than just dealing good damage yourself. And many party members, in fact ideally all of them, will be good at both of those roles. My main character to start with is a bard to win conversations, then because he's a bard, he has good control spells and good allied support buffs, and then he also, with two levels in Warlock, will have pretty good damage too. So, as you might expect from a bard, a jack of all trades. As for cantrips, I don't need this anymore now I'm not fighting Zalk anymore. So let's maybe take... This has some uses for luring enemies together. Let's go with that. Then for spells, I now have a druid that can cover that, so take it off the bard, have on the druid with some more spell slots instead. I don't mean spell slots, I mean spells prepared slots, if that makes sense. This is a very powerful single target debuff. This is okay, but probably not worth spending a spell slot on on a run like this where they're going to be so precious. Then a state comes into either sleep, which is very potent at the early levels, but then kind of falls off quickly. Or thunder wave, which also isn't great past early levels, but it's always kind of a good get off me type spell when you're surrounded by enemies or things like that. So I might take that. Starting instrument. Oh, let's go with a liar this time. And for stats, what I picked already was pretty good, I think. Dexterity is really important for going first, and they're having good armor class, and we're hitting with their ranged weapons and hand crossbows. Strength is good, but on a front man, I need to win some insight checks and perception checks, so I think I better have good wisdom on this guy. Athletics is a great scope. I'm no longer good at it because I don't have any strength anymore, so I'll pick it up later on when I get more skill points at higher levels. I think for now, I'll probably take instead... Insight. Very important for front character to win conversations, basically. Everything else can stay as it is, I would say. Alright. Now let's do Leiboing Zell. So she's currently a fighter, which is not a good damage dealing class and not a good control class either. I want to get her out of that and into a spellcasting class instead. In particular, I think I want to be a druid. Now, I didn't mention tanks among the you know, valid and useful roles, because tanking is not a thing in 5e or in Baldur's Gate 3. There's no way to control enemies and make them attack you consistently. There's Compel Duel, but it sucks at that job. It controls you more than it controls the enemy, and it costs a spell slot. So, the closest thing you can get to a tank is just being a character who you don't mind getting hit. And on a run like this, druids are pretty much the only ones who are like that, because they can just generate themselves so many free pools of bonus health, essentially. A druid can just morph into animal form and have, you know, a whole separate hit point bar that makes it completely go back to just being full health as a druid or whatever. So, that's a good way to, if I have to take a hit, have the druid do it, I would say. So let's go with... Thorn Rope is great for its occasional utility of pulling enemies closer to you. You don't always want that, but when you want it, you really want it. Shirley can be good. But I plan to have her fight either with ranged weapons, where it doesn't really matter, or... Give her an elixir of strength, perhaps, to supersede her bad strength score and replace it with a 20 for the early game, which will be better than her wisdom anyway, so that will make sure Lily not useful. I think having more people with guidance could be good. Resistance has its uses too. I think I'll go with guidance for now, but I'll pick up resistance later on, I'm sure. For abilities, we can dump that because we plan to either have her animal form that supersedes that or have a potion that supersedes that. Constitution should be 14. Dex, though, had better be higher. You should never have an odd number score like that, unless you're about to take a feat that'll make it even. So 16 dexterity, so we win initiative more often. We'll boost up to 20 strength shortly. Good constitution, good wisdom to cast more spells. Four points that aren't that important. Intelligence is useless. Charisma is pretty useless, but I will say, occasionally you're forced to have somebody other than the front man do a conversation, like if they got in trouble with the guard, for example. You gotta talk your way out of that could be worth something compared to just being worth nothing for now with strength, so let's go with that. As for skills, perception is probably the best skill in the game, along with maybe stealth, so let's take that. Insight's good for the front man, but useless for anybody else. We can kind of get this from an item we'll be picking up later on, so maybe skip it. 
I think the rest don't really matter that much. None of them are really that good. This never comes up, unless you're an alchemist or something. I don't know. Survival of the Spot Buried Treasure. And Animal Hammock, because anyone else will have it, probably. Keep your distance, darling. Yeah, let's do Korlak next, actually. So, as a druid, they still will kind of be offensive control. Druids have a lot of wonderful lockdown type spells to control the battlefield and prevent enemies from walking places you don't want them to. As a cleric, is that I plan for Karlak, she'll be more of a defensive control instead. She can fix debuffs on us, she can give us buffs to make us not miss our important attacks and things like that. And she can also, with the right type of cleric, do enormous burst damage. That is my plan for her. So, when it's something dead in an area, she'll be handling that as a Tempest Cleric. Not many times per day, but she can do it, and it'll be worth it, I think. So, let's go with Cleric. Let's go with Tempest, which gives us all armor proficiency, all weapon proficiency, and then most importantly, we get some good spells, and in future levels, we get some good perks, too. This one is kind of nice, but I hope not to use it, because I hope not to get hit. So, yeah. Deity doesn't really matter that much. I don't know. Let's go with Tear, because we find we can front the fake paladins of Tear later on. Cantrips. We, of course, want these two. She has this from her race. This would be good later on in, like, Act 2, but it's not useful right now. Pretty bad. We don't want to waste actions on that. I think Sacred Flame is probably the pick. Ability scores. Let's dump them down first and then see what we've got to work with. 16 Wisdom, so she can get more prepared spells. I think it's a good choice. 16 Dexterity to win initiative. Again, everyone wants to have that. Now, for Lazel, I said it wasn't really worth giving her good strength because we plan to either have her drink an elixir, which gives her a flat 20 strength, or have her in animal form. Those don't really apply to Karlak, however. She'll be just in her tiefling form all the time. She doesn't have an alternate form. So, for her strength is good for jumping distances and for not getting pushed or for pushing enemies and things like that. So let's go with that. She has this from her uh, background. These are not really useful. If she has to talk her way past the guard, that could be worth something. Hopefully not, but be prepared, I guess. I don't know, the rest don't really matter. So pretty much everyone else has been mostly controlled with some damage. Asarian will be our primary damage dealer. And I think it probably is best to have like no more than two primary damage dealers in your party, because there are big diminishing marginal returns. There aren't really that many great items for any one, you know, thing in the game. A limited number of good spellcasting items, a limited number of good damage boosting items, and so forth. You really don't get as much out of having a second warrior type character. It's not like it's bad, I'm not saying that. It could be a worthwhile part of our party, but there are diminishing marginal returns. You get more out of the first go with having just one warrior who has all the good items, and then get souped up further by your cleric and people like that, and the enemies get weakened to make him un unable to not kill them, basically. Now, Rogue is a respectable class, and I want it eventually. I think Ranger is a better start, though. Level 3 Rogue will give me basically 3 attacks per round. Level 3 Ranger will also give me 3 attacks per round, at least in the first round of combat, which I hope to make the only round of combat as often as possible. It also gives me much better defenses and better accuracy, too. So I think it's a better choice overall. And gets some utility as well from just getting a few spells. So, Ranger's a great pick up until level 5, after that I might go back to Rogue, we'll see. So, for favorite enemies, this one would be good in another kind of run. Incinerary Strike is a decent spell, at least in the early game, but I can't really spend many spell slots. I can't really afford to attempt that. Plus, it burst concentration. So, I don't think I want to do that. Protection for Evil and Good is pretty good. I have a lot of scrolls of that, but, you know, having the ability to cast it yourself is pretty good, too. Maze Breaker gives you True Strike, which is like the worst spell in the game, or close to it. Ranger Knight will be good later on. Heavy armor proficiency is quite good, but the thing is just that there is no heavy armor at all that's any good in the first majority of Act 1. You can get it kind of early if you rush and like let all the teethings get massacred and things like that, but for me I can't access it later on, until later on, so maybe take this at a higher level or respec into it. This one's the other one that's worth considering, I would say. Sacred Flame could have its uses, probably not though, so stick with Keeper of the Veil. Natural Explorer, no-brainer. Familiars are so good. So, keep this. Well, it went 14 Constitution for sure. And then, maybe even bring it up to 16, I would say. 
So now the question is, we want 14 strength or 14 wisdom. You know, the obvious choice would be wisdom, but let's think about what spell casting modifier like wisdom actually does for a ranger. The answer is not that much. Increases spell save DC, yes, but I plan to only cast really utility or saveless type spells. So it doesn't really help that much. It gives perception, that is pretty good. But strength gives melee attack when it forces melee attack. It gives shove with you know, athletics. It's probably better overall. It gives jump distance too. It's not going to be bad to be 14 wisdom instead, but I think this is probably the best choice overall. Rangers get multiple skills compared to most of the classes, so that's nice. We already have perception for being a high elf, that's nice too. Survival, I guess, is spot buried treasure. Why not? Athletics, so we can push people, that's a good choice. Alright, we are respect, we can level people up. Let me do a bit of shopping, though. I'm not going to do a whole lot of it, but just want to buy a few odds and ends and get my hand crossbow collection completed. Alright, let's give Maul a chit chat. Seems like a good moment to talk. I had a feeling you'd be back. Ah, I like that. Elixir of Vigilance is a pretty rare and pretty good elixir, I would say. Basically, lets you go first in combat all the time and not get surprised, which is pretty fatal for a run like this, if it happens. Alright, we're gonna run over to Damon now. Thought I sensed an inferno around here. But you aren't from Eltor. So we get this conversation here, which he's the person required to kind of advance Carlac's quest and fix her heart temporarily. Enlisted against my will by the Archdevil Zariel. I think I mentioned this whole thing of Eltra falling into the hells is the plot of the indie module that I haven't actually played or run because I never run the indie module, so let's just make up my own games. But it sounds moderately interesting, I will say. And it's kind of the prequel for this game in some ways, I guess. You brought some infernal machinery with you. He's a little too tempted by infernal stuff. He says he's glad to be out of the hells, but he sure seems to miss them. Very hot by the smell of it. Might be burning out a piston ring or leaking oil. Mind if I take a listen? You're my guest. But don't get too close. I mean, he should be as far resistant as her, but we kind of gloss over that in the story. You, you really are burning up. Whoever put that engine together. We'll find out more about who put it together. She's kind of a prototype, and they made better engines later on. So this is kind of a good setup for that, I would say. I might be able to help. I need infernal iron. And a prayer that my hammer will survive the work. Not to worry, the hammer will be just fine. Isn't meant to operate outside of Ernest. I'm not sure how much longer it'll keep running the way it's going. Will you be able to turn down the temperature a little? Worried I'm gonna go. She doesn't actually do any kind of on contact damage to enemies, so one of these days. Unless you use the soul coins, but that's not really night first. Even that it's not really on contact one, damage. Help both. If we can cool you off, it'll stabilize your engine and allow you to touch whomever you please. I've sensed some during our travels. So conveniently, you can give you a quest marker. I know where it is. We'll get a lot of it in Act 1, actually. More than we need, really. Once you know what you're looking for. Especially in Act 3, you get a ton of it you can't use anymore for some reason. Possibly, you know, I don't want to cut content or something. But we'll see. Meanwhile. I've still got plenty of weapons and armor in stock if you're looking to load up. We'll see. Let crossbow, no hand crossbow. Okay. Well, let's do a level up and see if that changes. So, I mentioned before I want to take two levels in Warlock. The justification in character is that he went to the Hells and was touched by Hellish power. So, take it for that reason. Friends is great for the frontman to have. Be careful who you use it on, because it does make people like you less, which could even start a fight. But... If you know when to use it, it's very powerful. To win social roles, basically. For spells, command is by far the, you know, the standout. Hex is runner-up. Not many good first-level spells here for this kind of run, to be honest. But, you know, command is good. As a fiend warlock. Over here, I think now I have so many scrolls of protection from evil, and that starting to cast it. Maybe I'll take Expedition's Retreat instead. Don't expect to use it, but I'll take it. And then here I'll take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast, so I can be a decent archer and push people back. That's a good mix of damage and control right there. All the worse if your party is all ranged, as I intend for mine to be before too long. So, 
you know, I'll get back to repairing spells once I have my whole list selected. For now, I'll just accept this garbage. But here's an important feature. This one here. Let's you maximize your thunder and lightning damage once per short rest. When you get the right combo going, that's a lot of damage. Not many times per day, but you can just nuke certain encounters. So, I like that. I feel like it's quite strategic to have to manage that kind of powerful few times per day resource on a run like this. Her races are a spell that's not really useful because it's only good for melee people, which I don't intend her to be. I'd say that the Zarya Tiefling race is probably the worst Tiefling. I think Asmodeus is probably the best one, for most purposes. So, spells. Bless, but one of the best spells in the game. You want that every character who can get it. Command, very good. Situational Guiding Bolt, I'll think about it. Hope not to ever need Healing Word, but sometimes you need it. Sanctuary, hope not to need it, but sometimes you need it. And... Aid will be great when they have a few higher level spell slots, I think. Silence is something that you often need to have. Hold person is very all or nothing, but very powerful when it lands. I think I'll probably not take that. I could probably do without it for these early levels. So that's what I'll go with for the time being. I might change that up later on. Let's take a look at Damon again here. Got an unmagical hand crossbow. I guess we'll take it. I hope they'll get more magical ones later on, but, you know. At least it's a complete set now. So, leveling up Lazel. Want to keep her as pure druid for now. Now, the subclass is a tough choice because... So, moon druids in 5e were phenomenally powerful. Just broken at level 2. In this kind of run, I think that Circle of the Moon in this game is pretty bad. Because in this game, every druid can kind of morph the same way that Circle of the Moon druid can do. Which takes away its special thing. We can all get powerful wild shapes. And furthermore... The Moon Druid's other supposed perk is both a morph as a bonus action rather than a standard action. Well, that might sound appealing at first, but there are some downsides to it too. See, pretty much every animal form has a generic attack that is okay, and then has this powerful special move that takes a bonus action. And so the upshot ends up being that if you're Circle the Moon Druid, you can morph and then do a generic attack, which isn't that great. But if you're any other kind of Druid, you can morph and then do a special move, which might be what you're looking for. So they might actually be better in some ways. Circle of the Land is mostly the more spellcasting type, and spellcasting is powerful, and I can use more spell slots, so that's pretty good. Spores is kind of the weird one. You get some necromancy type stuff, you get some just extra damage. I think I can use extra damage. I think there's at least an argument to be made for Spore Druid, and they get more useful perks other than that, so they're probably the best choice for my build overall. I'll come back to these next level, once I have my full selection. So, not going to worry about too much now. Useless jump, because we have actual good jumping ability. Let's take long shred, let's take jump. Fairy fire is phenomenal. Entangle is pretty good sometimes. We've got some people who have healing word, but can probably pass on that. Pass without trace is wonderful, if we can uh, you know, spare it. The whole party basically never fails stealth checks. But it won't be abusing stealth here, so it's less useful for me. Spike growth is extremely good. Like, the standout level 2 druid spell, I would say. The amazing battlefield control. So one more spell. I think I'll take Thunder Wave for when it deal AoE damage. Useful once in a while. And for Astarian. So, Fog Cloud I think is probably the standout on this list. Entangling Strike is kind of appealing, but on this run I don't have many spell slots to work with, so I really can't do that very often. Plus it takes concentration and a bonus action, so it's a big trade-off of losing out in your spells that are ongoing and losing out in your damage. So I think not really that great. Goodberry could be okay healing for its spell slot, basically. Hunter's Mark is overrated, but there will be some tough targets this is worthwhile for. So I think I will take it and consider it for those ones. Fighting style, archery is amazing. Plus two to attack rolls in this game is substantial for just actually hitting. So take that for sure. Level 3 Ranger, I think no-brainer choice, Gloomstalker here. They get so many great features. They get this one where they get plus 3 bonus to initiative is wonderful, just always win initiative. You love that. Movement speed bonus is great, especially with hand crosses that have kind of short range. And an extra attack that even deals extra damage, like what more could you want? And it's not even everything. You get Ultra Dark Vision, which doesn't matter that much, but hey, you get it. As like a perk on an otherwise really great already class. And you get the ability to hide as a bonus action, just like a thief. 
or just like a rogue hood that's also nice sometimes, and you get visible to turn invisible. I don't see that get that much play in this game, but it's something. And this is great too for you know guys just have to fit into your holes and whatnot. So just a truckload of great features. Glimpsocker is really really good. You know maybe I should take Goodberry, but I hope not to use Goodberry. So hopefully this is, ends up being the wrong choice if you know what I mean. Thanks, With that, let's hit the road and hope to get in a goblin fight. And then let's have a Starion. Step lightly. Go to camp. Are you still telling us? We already did the conversation, man. Okay. Anyway. Basically, I just want to go over to... I don't know. Um, Gale? No, not Gale. He has poison blood. Over here to Will. Go to hide bus, I won't hurt him. And do my bite attack to get the happiness bonus. Which gives me plus one to everything. Which is just incredible. That, as I said, just makes the starting just the best companion for pretty much every kind of role that involves any kind of you know, important role to make. Uh, here we have Aridin's group. The dead companions. It goes to the quest here. Might as well do that. Busy with the foul bloods in Elson's Grove. Not no more. The contract didn't mention no goblins. I would have prepped the lads, brought better weapons. The kind that leaves half your crew dead. It was a, a criminally undetailed, inaccurate contract that put them on completely the wrong trail because the guy who wrote it was an idiot, a high int idiot. That's it. If you think you can do better, I feel like a sudden ex expression change there. Supposed to be hidden under the temple where the goblins jumped us. I'd give you a map of the temple and wish you a happy funeral. But my mate Brian kept hold of it like his own sodger. Goblins made sure to the fat old chunk. He's pretty callous about all those dead guys, but I can show you where we turn back. Oh well. If you feel like dying, <laughs> don't thank me. I'll be well on my so he says this, but then when you get to Baldur's Gate, having done it successfully, then try to you know, tell you that you owe him a share of the reward, and just glad to be rid of the bloody then later on he'll try to steal the reward from you if you refuse. That, and it's a whole thing. We're wasting time. I think we already looted these guys. They'll become okay to loot again once these guys are away. They are just clipping right to that goblin town wall, aren't they? Okay. So this is a place that really rewards exploration, I would say, which is great. If you go up here, it's clearly an ambush. You can see the goblin shot people here. You might be able to spot the goblins up there. If you have good spot checks and whatnot. So you could walk in and get shot, or walk in and you know, do diplomacy. But, if you explore a bit, you can find there's an even better option. So I'm going to do that. Are you... Is Karlak on her way, or... Anyway, exploring a bit. Let's go over here to these creepy woods. We can also meet a dog over here, perhaps, and take care of that. Put runners in camp later on. I realize I don't have animals speaking on right now, so I need to just you know, deal with them the old-fashioned way. So his master there, a gombuk, I think it was, has been killed. We'll eventually meet the kind of the kennel where he comes from, the uh, mail carrier's guild, or something like that. I can do guidance on this one. That's a success. You see a name etched into the leather. Scratch. If we can talk to him, find out he basically thinks his master is still alive. But I uh, can't do that right now because I don't have any more animal speaking potions, I don't think. I'm sure I'll get some soon, they're pretty common. He whines, but remains rooted by the corpse's side. So we'll get him in camp next time we go there, I think. Now hopefully Carla caught up during all of that. No. Okay, let's ungroup her again so no one else runs back to her. There she is. Well, that's not too far off. Alright, come on, Carla. Well, speaking of people falling behind, 
Let us cast Long Shredder on everyone. And for that matter, let's also summon up your familiar. There are many familiar options, but really there's only one, the Raven. It's better than even the special familiars like Imps and Quasits in most ways, I would say. So. Definitely Raven familiar. Let's go with Astral Knowledge of Dexterity. So you get Stealth and Sleight of Hand and Acrobatics to avoid being pushed. And then let's start throwing out Long Shredder on everybody. Time to rest. Now I should switch up some weapons here, I suppose, too. You've got that. And you can now finally use a shield and armor. We don't really have great armor for you yet, but that'll help improve your armor class a lot. There's a shield that'll make it even better. That's what we're talking about. You need a shield too, I would say, and a short sword instead of that maul. There's another shield. That's good armor class. That's what good armor class looks like at this point in the game. And we have two hand crossbows now, so no more of that for you. You're being upgraded. Hopefully we get some magic ones soon. And for me, there's gloves so I can deflect arrows. I think everything else is okay for now. Could use that elixir, but I think I'm going to try to save it. I just want to get the two things out of the way, and then get that little cutscene I was talking about, and then move on. Where's the way up? I know this one around here somewhere. Not there! Whew. You don't want to go in there. I put the whole party in stealth mode. There's a creep into the goblin town here. Uh, ravens and other summons don't get the message. They must be manually stealth, which is kind of a nuisance. Bugbear's sleeping over there. Bugbears are pretty formidable, so I'm going to keep, come up to him while he's sleeping and just kill him like that. I think that's what we're meant to do. If we get close to him... We then do a critical automatically with our great sword there for some massive damage. Good start. Oh, everyone else is still in stealth. He's he's a sleepy boy apparently. He is surprised, so I don't need to kill him now. I could walk away and shoot him, and then maybe give him to Ballista to get a few free temporary hit points. And this can't kill him either, so let's try that. Just poke him for a little bit of damage. This. this should be fine. So almost certainly this will now kill him. Nope, missed. Okay. Still got a chance, but I probably won't get the temporary hit points. Ah, there we go. Okay, that made up for it. Good luck making up for bad luck. Alright. Let us... Sneak on over here and get up to the roof where the goblins are waiting for us and ambush the ambushers. What's hiding here? Bit of jewelry there, that's money, I guess. So there they are lying in wait as we come up behind them. Hoping the armor doesn't actually clank in character, I guess. So here for this one, I think I want to go with pushing the person off the cliff to hopefully death. With a fast person who will then hopefully win initiative. Okay. So they try to talk to us there, but then they finish falling off to their soon-to-be death. Let's take out that tracker because they can hurt us. Let's take out this tracker up here because they can hurt us. Everyone else is unimportant in comparison. Can I just shove you off? Goblins are like mini, so they're not hard to shove even for people who are kind of noodly armed like Ballista is now. There we go. So this is the first round of combat, so he's got his Gloomstalker super shot. So let's do that. Shoot that one down there, I'd say. Wow, that was improbable. All right, let's try that again. There we go. Okay, once again, you know, bad luck followed by good luck. It balances out. One HP guy down there, or this one over there. That's probably better use of a star compared to the good shot. So let's go with that. 
Then we're going to back away from the edge to make ourselves a less easy target for the guys on the other side, I think. Make way. Now we've got an offhand shot that should finish off. Oh, you know what we could try? Will Halo of Spores that uses a reaction to get there. No, too low. Okay. Let's use our weak attack on the 1 HP guy. She's not proficient, but it's still pretty, you know, good accuracy overall. It's well worth using hand crossbows on everybody, regardless of proficiency, because you just get so much damage off of them. Alright, there we go. And then we'll back on up. Maybe you can rehide so you can get, you know, ambush them when they come closer. Uh, you, I guess, likewise can rehide. The two over there shouldn't have a target, because they're too far from the edge, so they have to walk down to low ground where we can then destroy them. Don't think they'll end up near those barrels, they usually don't, spacing wise, in my experience. But still, they're gonna come down to where we want them to be. That's all to the good from our perspective. So, we did a couple good things there. We divided and conquered, took the good terrain, struck by surprise, in a way that I think was intended by the game. So, I liked how that went. Two of them close together. We could, if they were next to that barrel, we could hit them with that, but they're not, so. Oh well. Ah, if I get a little bit closer, I can get rid of that disadvantage. I should do that. Ah, still got it. Huh. There we go. Get away from the edge so they don't have a clear line of effect to us, so they can't attack. She has much worse accuracy because she it doesn't have proficiency. But it should still be good enough to probably hit with one of these attacks. I could try this instead. It's weaker but more accurate. Might be worth going for. That's something. So in that case, I can probably have Ballista use his offhand attack to finish off the 2 HP guy. Oh man, that range. That is the one downside of hand crossbows, I would say. Ah, okay. He could push back that... Booyog. Who is now near the Explodey Barrel, so I could maybe shoot that if I wanted to. If I had an action left to do that with. But I think I'm down to just two attacks, so... Not super feasible. I do have advantage on this one. If I have a powerful range attack, I don't think I do though. So I could throw something for decent damage, maybe. Got any tridents? Might kill with this height advantage. There we go. Let's see if I can finish this guy off too. Yep, if we get closer, let's see if we can finish this guy off too. There we go. So, not a scratch on me. Alright, we've got more goblins to fight through, at which point we can then get that last forced rest out of the way and then move on to the adventure proper. Thank you for watching, everyone. And a special thank you to my Patreon supporters Master Knight DH, Jackie, and Lino, George Grin, Travis, Gregory, Danny Hall, William Wakefield, Jeffrey Morse, Dylan Wagner, Just Becca, and Jack. Have a great day, everyone.